go ahead and get started. I want to I want to thank everyone for joining us today. You know, this is my first time using Zoom webinar, uh, so bear with me as I learn this on the fly. But I've been wanting to do an, uh, some interviews like this with some investors I respect and admire for the community. And to be honest with you, a lot of the investors that I that I reach out to, um, they really don't want to talk about what they're doing. And Michael Shern is one of those people too, by the way. Uh, but Michael was kind enough to say yes. I've tried to get him to come to our summit a few years in a row. He's um, he's declined every time, but for some reason, I don't know if he was drinking excessively or what, but he said yes to this Zoom webinar, so I'm honored that, to have him here with us today. So, Michael, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me, and and, and for pointing out my alcohol problem. <laughs> <laughs> Anytime. <laughs> maybe I, I thought maybe I'd just give a quick intro and then – what I'll do is ask Michael a few questions, and then we'll open it up to the audience if you have any questions. And I believe the way you ask a question is through the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, and so I think that's how today will go. We'll probably try to end this in about an hour, mainly because my kids get home around then and they'll come bursting through this door. And I don't believe anybody wants to see that. But, um, but I... Michael is probably best known for writing the book, The Investment Checklist, The Art of In-Depth Research. And it's a really very, very in-depth book on almost every nuance of researching a business and people. And I encourage everyone to read it uh, if you haven't. And we'll talk a little bit about that book today. But, you know, Michael's also a fund manager. And this is, this is where he gets pretty interesting. You know, even though he wrote a 300-page book on checklists, he's evolved quite a bit. And he's a very qualitative focused investor and spends a bulk of his time analyzing leadership and management teams. And, um, you know, he's also a very concentrated investor. I think in his last quarterly letter, it showed that he owned five positions and 40% cash, which is pretty unique. Again, I think, I don't think you see many people investing like that very often. And on top of this, you know, you would think since he's very qualitative focused that he wouldn't be very price disciplined. And what you'll find is he's extremely disciplined on price. Uh, so I wanted to lead with that so you can see how his investment style doesn't really fit into a box or, or he doesn't really have a label. And that's probably the first significant thing I learned from him through a lot of the dialogue that I've had with Michael is he doesn't fit into a box and, you know, he's not afraid to be different. And oftentimes it's in those differences that you create an edge and that's where your edge lies. And I think that's uh, Michael's edge as well. And so maybe this is a good place to start actually on that topic, Michael, you know, what do you see as some of the dangers in labeling yourself, you know, anything, a value investor, growth investor, whatever? Well, I think for me, the lesson was that you stay consistent with that approach uh, and then you form a community around it and you kind of don't listen to people outside of that. So the you know, same thing would be if you label yourself a, a Republican or a Democrat, you're going to stay consistent with those ideals, even though you may not completely agree with everything that is going on within that system, you, you kind of stay consistent. So for me, you know, saying I was a value investor, I would listen to Warren Buffett talk about not investing in technology. And, you know, with the moment he said, you know, I don't invest in technology, I said the same thing. I don't invest in technology. And everybody within my own community did the same thing. And so, you know, that's kind of where I thought it was very dangerous to start labeling uh, because it, you, you just, it, it keeps you out of of learning new, new things or new fields. Like somebody would pitch me a technology idea and I, I, I no, no, I don't even want to hear it. I, I just don't invest in technology. You know, it's not in my circle of competence. Um, so I was trying to stay consistent with that world. Uh, the other thing is uh, valuation frameworks. Uh, so uh, within value investing, finding a company with a competitive advantage is one of the dogmas of it. And, you know, later I learned that most money in the business is created after a, a business creates its competitive advantage, not after it already has one. Uh, so I just found that, that it became very dangerous to kind of say, hey, I belong to this niche and that's all I'm going to do. And, and once I kind of said, hey, I'm not, not going to do that anymore. I'm just going to learn from different investment styles. And then it opened up a, a bigger world for me. Mm -hmm. no, that makes sense. Uh, maybe, maybe tell people a little bit about your, your background, you know, where you're from, uh, how did you first get interested in investing and maybe who were some of the people that kind of impacted you early on your journey? Yeah, I, I'm from originally from El Paso, Texas, and I now live in Austin, Texas. Um, 
And, uh, you know, I got interested in investing in high school, uh, just started reading some things on Warren Buffett, and it just resonated for whatever reason, you know, maybe the same reason as somebody went in and saw a surgery, and they just really were fascinated by it, you know, I'd faint, but it was kind of the same effect for me, you know, reading the book. And so I just kind of went and studied everything I could about Warren Buffett, started attending the Berkshire annual meetings uh, very early on, and uh, just kind of developed a passion for the investing uh, uh, just learning about businesses. I've really enjoyed learning about different types of businesses. I didn't see myself as someone who would like run one kind of business. You know, I like learning from different kinds. Um, and so that's kind of the, the early start as, as far as mentors. Uh, yeah, there, there's so many good and bad. Um, you know, one of them that the, the one that really changed the way I view companies and leadership was Dave Gold, the founder of 99 cent only stores. Um, because I was involved in that company, I learned that as an investor, we dehumanize companies. And so it's very interesting that we just kind of look at the numbers. We just look at uh, metrics, uh, things that make sense to us because our training, you know, most investors are working in r rooms alone uh, or just with a very small group of people. And so we're just kind of looking at outputs uh, all of the time. And, you know, at the end of the day, the most important thing about a business is that it's made up of people and the people that you have at that business are what creates the value. And so it's almost like you're, you're moving away uh, from that kind of thinking. So he kind of taught me to uh, not dehumanize a business and understand that, uh, you, you know, look at it in a, in a completely different way uh, than, than the finance background that I kind of took to it. So when you made that transition, and I believe in a, in a couple other interviews, you talked about how you were kind of first investing in special situations or bankruptcies, and then it kind of evolved, you know, over time into more of a qualitative approach. You know, did you do that before you got into fund management? Or was this during, you know, kind of when you're professionally managing money that you kind of made that transition? Yeah, I think it, uh, it was more, uh, uh, not trying to think how I, not trying to change history here. That's something that <laughs> kind of interesting. You, you change the story. You know, I, I was always qualitatively oriented. I always liked interviewing people, just something I enjoyed. Uh, so that, that's always run through. So, you know, when I invested, I just looked at different things that whatever the investors that I was following at that time were doing. Um, so, you know, uh, maybe early heroes uh, that, that uh, saw them investing in, a, in, let's say, a Marty Whitman into a bankruptcy. Well, then I went and, and studied that. So I was just kind of latching on to what other investors were doing. And I think you do a lot of copying, you know, early on in your career, and then you kind of come up with your own style. Um, but it was really just, you know, whatever the people at that time that were getting a lot of press within my community, the value investing community, um, is kind of what I would follow at that time. I don't know if that answers your question. No, it does. It does. And, you know, I think in some of the work or some of the interviews, you talk about the types of leaders you look for and you refer to them as Mount Rushmore leaders. Can you explain sort of what that means and what, how you identify those people? Yeah, so where you know what 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 I'm looking to invest in is I want to find like the most innovative leaders that are building these growing businesses that you know customers love and where the most talented people want to work. You know, that's basically sums up everything I do. And so in order to find the most innovative leaders, you kind of have to invest in the best of the best, you know, uh, the ones that are really building and scaling these companies uh, such as Toby Lutke at Shopify, Andy Bechtelsheim at Arista Networks. And so Mount Rushmore leaders are, are really, uh, there's a, a few things that define them. They tend to be, the number one thing they are is they're problem solvers. Uh, they never, ever, you will never catch a Toby or an Andy Bechtelsheim talk about selling. Um, they never use selling language. They never use selling uh, things like add-ons or, or words of, uh, everything is about solving the problem. You know, how do we make it easy for an entrepreneur to start a business? You know, how do we create a uh, switch uh, for a data center that can scale and, and bring in the most number of, of technology, uh, uh, you know, open, it, that's open to all the kinds of technology. So they're, that's kind of where their focus is. So a Mount Rushmore leader is, is they're, they're just, I, I always say they're motivated by solving, not motivated by selling. You know, that's an easy way to remember. And, and I just look for that language. Um, there's surprisingly, most businesses are in the business of selling. Um, 
So if you pick up any uh, quarterly conference call or, uh, you know, just randomly read it, you'll see that, you know, they're talking about the financials, the numbers, the sales they made. Uh, but Mount Rushmore leaders just talk a whole different language. You know, they're talking about what, what they're solving next, the frustrations they're having, uh, the, the limitations of technology or whatever it is that they're encountering is kind of what they talk about. Um, so they're easy to spot once you start just kind of hanging around that group, a little bit harder to spot if you're mixing around a lot. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think you also refer to kind of chefs versus cooks, if, I, if I'm not mistaken. And, and what are the difference between a chef and a cook? Well, I was always, uh, I, I've watched some master chefs and, and they don't do much, you know, in the kitchen. You know, you, you think a master chef would be somebody that's working a lot in the kitchen and they're kind of not. Um, they're kind of overseeing things, making little changes here and there. Uh, so a chef is, is really a, a kind of, or it's almost like a conductor as well. They're orchestrating all of the cooks under them that are doing line item things, you know. So a cook might be, a, you, you have sous chefs, you know, the ones that specialize or, or uh, you know, you have just different types of cooks within the kitchen that specialize with appetizers or the main course. And the cook, I mean, the chef is kind of overseeing all of this. And so uh, most uh, managers that are out there are cooks. You know, they came about because they were a really good lawyer. They were a really good uh, CFO. Uh, so they only have kind of one uh, mode of thinking or one mode of training, you know, but then they can't transform into all of a sudden becoming a chef. Um, and so chefs tend to be founders, you know, the, the, the ones that kind of create the dishes, the innovators, the problem solvers, um, and, and the cooks just kind of follow the orders. They're really good at following the order. Uh, and I, I mean, the analogy is like Apple today is run, you know, I would say not by a chef, you know, Steve Jobs was the chef, but Tim Cook is the cook, right? Like he was a very good at operations. Uh, most of his focus was on operations, but when it comes to innovation, you know, Apple really has not innovated a lot of tremendous things in the last few years. Um, and so uh, the, the chefs are the ones coming up with the new dishes and, and, and the cooks are the ones that are finding better ways to make those dishes. Um, and so it, it, it's just kind of the analogy I use to describe professional managers versus kind of your founder type CEOs. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I remember another thing we talked about was you talk about how these types of Mount Rushmore leaders, they have a certain intensity with them. You know, even when talking to investors, it's like they, they don't like the chit chat very often. You know, I, I remember you gave a few examples yeah. when we talked. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so there's two patterns to them. Um, I should be called the Asperger's or on the spectrum fund. So one, one thing I found, a lot, a lot of those leaders are on the spectrum, uh, show Asperger's syndrome. And... Um, you know, they, they, their brain thinks differently um, in a good way. Uh, I, I think Asperger's, people with Asperger's are the ones that really drive society forward. I mean, even Turing uh, was well known that later on uh, when, when Moore was known of, about Asperger's uh, that, that, he, that he, had, he was on the spectrum. And the thing is that being on the spectrum allows them to focus on the mission. So they, they tend to focus more than anyone else. And something that makes them look uh, kind of bad, but it, it's actually a good thing, is that they're very uh, good about getting rid of people or employees that are no longer adding value to the project. So if you no longer meet the mission, you no longer meet uh, that you're not going to solve the problems that they need solved, they kind of get rid of people. And, and that's kind of why they're able to scale. Uh, so one of the reasons companies don't scale is because they hold on to people that no longer fit at the company. So if you look at like say the history of Shopify, which has scaled, you'll see that the, the, the executives have changed quite a bit over time. I mean, it's, it's just, they, they've brought in different people as it's, as it's scaled to different levels. So the people that were there when it was 10 people uh, are no long, you know, were no longer there when it was a hundred. And that's why most companies actually stagnate is that they don't change the people. There's, I, I couldn't do it quite frankly. You know, I'm, I, I feel like it's important to be loyal and things like that, but uh, you know, somebody no longer meets the mission. They don't want to, they, they no longer, uh, if the mission is to continue to grow and they're like happy, they don't, they don't like all the change that's going on. Well, they're, it's not a good place for them to be either. Um, so people with Asperger's tend to be able to focus on who adds value uh, to the company and, um, and, and at, at the different phases. So they're very mission focused. They're, they're kind of outside of themselves. You know, there's definitely selfish people that are on the spectrum and, 
Um, some of them are money managers um, that are there to kind of make their own money. Uh, but, but the ones that are mission focused tend to, to think that way. So that's, that's the one uh, thing that I found um, that they, they kind of, uh, they, they, they think a certain way. Um, the other thing that I, is the bad parents. Um, so I always wondered, you just talked about intensity. They are just on all the time. And they just, they just, they're not the type of person that you'd enjoy having a beer with. Uh, hanging out at the restaurant with. I mean, it's just they're constantly intense. They're constantly attacking your ideas um, because they're learning, um, and, but they're just very intense. And what I found was that most of these leaders, even if you look at historically in time, had a parent that didn't believe in them. You know, so I was wondering where the intensity came from because once they achieve a certain level of money or, or financial success, they, they, they don't slow down. Uh, you look at a, a, an Elon Musk, uh, I don't mean to pick on him, but you know, it's pretty well known his father uh, was very difficult with him. He used to put him down for hours at a time every night. And there, there, ha there has to be, you know, even Warren Buffett's mother uh, was known to put him down uh, throughout his childhood. And so that is kind of like the, the bad parents is what creates the intensity. Um, the on the spectrum is what creates the focus. And, and so, again, Steve Jobs was sometimes characterized as being an, an a-hole. And, and quite frankly, he wasn't, you know. He, he just kind of told you what he was thinking, you know? So people that are on the spectrum tend to just say what they're thinking. Uh, they don't hide. Um, and so they come off like jerks, uh, but you know, we're all thinking it anyways, you know, we're jerks too. It's just that they say it. Uh, and so there's something about putting it out on the table. Like, no, I don't like that. No, that's not useful. Uh, that, that actually helps you get through on solving the problem rather than say paying politics or not wanting to hurt somebody's feelings and things like that. So there's a big advantage. Uh, that I found to to these leaders uh, that that they're on the spectrum. A lot of them won't admit it or don't, but they 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 kind of all have that pattern. Um, so maybe talk a little bit about your pro your process of finding them or, or maybe confirming that this person is you know a Mount Rushmore leader. I mean, obviously you look through the last what they've said in maybe their letters or how they talk about the business or their earnings calls, things of that nature. Uh, but then do you, I'm guessing you could take it a step further. Are you reaching out to them, trying to meet with them before you make an investment? Are you confirming they, uh, that they are what they are by talking to people around them? Like, how do you go around about doing that, that diligence? Yeah, I think meeting management is overrated, uh, quite frankly. I think they're that, uh, I, so I don't actually do that. I end up knowing them after a, a amount of time, but it's kind of more of a natural process and I'm not, I'm not introduced to them as like, a, I'm an investor in the company or it's, it's kind of in a different capacity. So I, I, I do think there is a misnomer that you have to meet or that people think you have to meet management, see it, look at them in the eye. Um, there's actually a big record. Uh, so I work with a research librarian uh, and she puts together, you know, when we're first say starting to look at, at a CEO, she puts together all the articles that have been written about that CEO uh, from, it could be a local business journal, um, wh wherever they're quoted. And what we're looking for is certain stories um, uh, that indicate that they're, number one, the lens that we use is, are they problem solving? I mean, uh, or are they talking about sales? So recently we were looking at a CEO, uh, everything met our criteria, high margins, growing like 90% a year. But the CEO in his conference calls and his communications kept talking about upselling, you know, creating new products uh, to sell to the customers. Um, and that was the whole emphasis of his call. And, every, and, and just historically, you could see that that's all he talks about. And so what you find is that actually the product at his company was invented by a CTO that was no longer there. So it was a great product. But then they kind of, uh, you know, as, as sales started stagnating for that prognate or they, uh, or they saw that they were maturing, uh, they started to pursue, uh, you know, new products that weren't as helpful for the customer. So we look at customer reviews. Uh, uh, we look at things like a blind uh, because we're looking at a lot of technology companies. That's like Indeed or Job Board. Uh, kind of, it's kind of like a glass door, I guess, for, for uh, technical engineers or, or uh, computer engineers. Um, so we're, we're looking at what it's like to work there. Um, and, you know, even, even looking at Glassdoor, you know, it's uh, it, it, something that's very helpful is, is 
is if you see that the company, one of the things that we'll just pass on automatically is if we see that the company is fabricating their Glassdoor ratings, and it's pretty easy to see because what happens is you'll see all these positive reviews and under cons, nobody will list anything. They'll say none. And I, I have learned that that's uh, the way employees kind of send an FU to the company for forcing them to write uh, a, uh, uh, you know, it's kind of like a, what, what you're not saying is saying a lot, you know, like, hey, I was forced to write this review that I'm not, the reason I'm not putting any cons is because I want you to know what I just said is not true. So, uh, so we're looking at different, you know, the articles is really uh, where, where we start, just stories uh, about them, things they did or, um, and, and, and just, it, it, just uh, cert, like Bruce Flatt, you know, early on, like uh, one of my favorite stories is uh, during 9-11, how he, you know, drove down to New York uh, to, to go actually look at the properties physically to be there. You know, that, that's a sign of a, of a really good leader that's just going to be down there with the employees rather than trying to manage it from, from Canada. Um, so you're just, I'm just looking for certain stories that'll pique my interest. Um, what, one story that I really liked about Toby and, uh, was that when he was complaining about a coffee maker and that it took, or I think it was a tea maker, uh, but it took like four steps to, to heat water and it really bothered him. And it's like, you, you can say to yourself, well, why does that matter? And it's like, well, that's everything. The guy is saying that, you know, if we don't have everything done well inside this place, how could we expect to have super high quality outside of here? So looking for quotes like that, that kind of are indicators that I'm running into a Mount Rushmore. If I'm not learning anything, you know, every time I read about Toby, or I, I just read his conference call recently, I, I learned something from him. Uh, the way he thinks through problems or, uh, or I watch an inter interview with him, I'm learning something from him. But with most CEOs, you're just getting the, the news. You know, what happened in the quarter? Our sales went up this much. We sold this many machines, uh, you know, uh, the, and so whenever I run into that, I, I know I'm, I, I'm not running into a great leader because I, it's just a great leader's brain just thinks completely differently. So where, where do you draw that line then? I mean, you, let's say you you oh. found a business, you mentioned one earlier that it had great margins growing 90%. Uh, but you didn't like how he talked about sales versus process. You know, if he, if he would have mentioned sales three less times in the call, would he have been in like, okay, well, I can make this invest. Like how strict does that become then for you? Yeah, so a Mount Rushmore will never even talk. I mean, they may, they may talk about sales in the context of we did $2 billion in revenues, but that's about it. Uh, so they will never talk about upselling. They will never use the word, we're upselling to our customers or, or, uh, or even focus a lot on the metrics, you know, saying that, you know, we're able to, you know, sell 50% uh, you know, of our customers are buying one additional product to us. Whenever we run into that language, we just pass. Um, mm -hmm. It sounds stringent, but it's just Mount Rushmore leaders. I just don't, I, they never use, they, their brain just doesn't even think that way. Uh, they, they, they think, why would I even, <laughs> you know, they can find that information in the 10K. Why would I repeat it? It makes no sense to me. That's kind of how their brains are wired. What type of kind of back testing or historical analysis have you done that gives you confidence that, you know, this is the way you should invest? Or is it more of a personal approach where these are the types of people that you connect with, like holistically? that you can kind of see through to the end as an investor? Yeah, as far as connecting to them, I, I don't connect much to them because they tend not to be, um, <laughs> you know, the, the ones you want to get. Right. To um, but uh, yeah, I'm trying to, yeah, I, I think it's just, I learned that there is a pattern to the most innovative. Mm -hmm. um, and I just started seeing it over and over. Uh, and, and it's even, even the ones that are not on the spectrum have the same pattern is that they're just really focused. Uh, again, most investors don't even think about this is, are they solving an important problem? The more important problem they solve, the bigger the growth. Uh, and are they simplifying? You know, the other thing is, the other thing that they all share in common is they simplify things. Uh, so when you look at Roku, you know, a lot of people have a Roku in their home. It looks so simple. You know, it's just even the, the remote is very simple. But what you don't realize is that there is so much that goes into making something look so easy. Because if you look at the old TV remotes, that was kind of the standard. And there was a reason because it was kind of too hard to simplify. Um, so they have a simplification mindset, you know, where they're constantly finding ways to make it easier to use their product or service. Um, you know, I can determine the, the rate of growth of a company by how quickly you can 
uh, implement it. You know, like uh, for example, Fastly is another investment of ours. And uh, you, as a as a software engineer, or a software developer, you can in 30 seconds uh, start using their code um, and seeing if it works for you. Um, so it, the the barrier to entry for you to get in there and try it is very low. Uh, you look at Apple historically, the I/O system. You know, which they, was an open. Uh, a system w was very easy to use uh, for people to code. Uh, so they have a simplification mindset where they're constant and it's it even it goes with the way they communicate. So one of the things that I challenge a lot of private company CEOs is, or even public company CEOs, is I say, can you summarize what you do in one sentence? And I've only one found one CEO who can do that. And it's Toby Lutke who says, you know, you can start your online retail business on your lunch hour. And the most important word on there is lunch hour. So the whole company knows that they have to be able to make things so simple that it's not going to take a, a, an ordinate amount of time for somebody to get, to get up and, and use it. It's, it's just got to be super intuitive uh, uh, because engineers like to kind of complicate things or uh, just naturally, you know, they, they deal with very complicated things. So, so they say, no, 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 we have to. So just by communicating that to the whole organization, it's done wonders for them to be able to scale. So the simplification mindset and, and communicating it is, is what allows you to, to really grow quickly. Most CEOs uh, don't do that. Um, one that I am invested in that is now focused is Matt Calkins at Appian. When I watched his early videos at his kind of Appian day, I forget the, it's kind of their customer day. It was very, it, I, I never understood what he was talking about. He was talking in technical terms. Um, I didn't understand what he was, what his company did. Uh, when I, I, I like to just pick up a conference call when I'm looking at a company that I haven't heard of and I just read it and I'm like, can I figure out what this company does? And it's like 99% of the time I can't figure out, you know, I, I know that they do maybe lab tests, but I, I can't figure out what they do. Um, and so Matt Hawkins over time has gotten a lot uh, better at simplifying the message saying, you know, our software is like building Legos and, you know, using good analogies. And, and so therefore more and more customers can understand what you do as well, rather than using like terms like low code, you know, it's like, oh, well, we're a low code provider. It's like, well, what's that mean? That's, that's like subject to interpretation, you know? It's like, uh, you know, CEOs that say, you know, I'm transparent. It's like, well, what's that mean? That's a very, you know, the words that are subject to, in transportation, uh, to interpretation are things that I tend to avoid. I look for simple direct language that is like not subject to interpretation. And I see, and, and that's kind of how you can spawn them as well is they communicate very clearly. Mm -hmm. so. so maybe switching from leadership for, for a minute, you know, in your last letter, I believe you're in five companies. And I don't, I don't know if that's, you know, ultimately the amount that you always like to be in, but you're in five companies, 40% cash, you know, maybe just talk a little bit about, you know, have you always been a concentrated investor and, and why is that? Yeah. So I first started being a concentrated investor because honestly, Buffett said it was good to be. A, so I, I, you know, I didn't have the conviction in it. Right. Like, um, so I, I did it because I was copying, you know, and, that, and that's kind of like, uh, as you start as an investor, it's just part of the process you copy. Uh, so that mentality, I guess that's where it first started, but I wasn't doing it for the right reasons. Um, what happens is that I, as my criteria has increased in the type of company I'm willing to look at, it, it just narrows my world uh, to where I'm, uh, you know, there's probably 50 publicly traded companies that I would invest in and uh, 20 that I can say I'd do it for sure. Uh, the other 30 we're investigating, you know, are still in investigation mode where we haven't really figured out. Uh, some are mature. You know, the problem is that, you, you, you know, some are already too big. Uh, there's not a lot of growth prospects, but uh, it's just hard to find really good ideas. Um, and so it's, it's I, I would love to have more, you know, I, I, I would, you know, so it's uh, now I, I, I would, I, I would include it. The other thing is that there's just not, the valuations are crazy right now. So you mentioned the 40% in cash. Well, it's just the valuations of all these companies are they all hit my five-year price target today, you know? <laughs> so it's like, I, I can't make any money off these things, you know? I mean, they have to grow, uh, you know, when I value these companies, I'm like, for me to double my money in the next uh, three years or five years, uh, I, I, you know, they have to grow 150%. And it's like, I just don't see how that's possible. Um, and so, um, you know, that's kind of explains the high cash position. I also learned back in 2008, I used to be fully invested. Um, and so uh, back then, the worst thing that happened to me in 2008 was that I 
that I had to sell things to buy other things. And so I was making two decisions at the same time. And that complicated things very much. You know, well, should I sell this? Well, it's still upside, but uh, so my decision-making got very complicated. And so that's where I learned to carry a, a healthy uh, cash balance. I also have really good partners that are, you know, I, I, I take their money whenever I think my fund is undervalued. So, you know, for two years, I haven't taken in money. Um, I did in March, you know, I called them and, and, and they put in cash. Uh, so that kind of drove our cash balance up as well because things kind of took off, you know, uh, we had like a, a, a maybe it's a two week window to buy things, you know, and then it, it just got away from us. And so that's, that's kind of the reason for the high cash balance. It's just, things are crazy right mm -hmm. now. Um, so it, it sounds like you have maybe 50 companies that are in your universe. You're doing diligence on 30 of them. Um, you probably like to own right now 20 of them if the price is right. Is correct. that correct? Correct. Um, so how, how do you decide on what the correct price is for you and, and what's allowed you to be as disciplined as you are today? Yeah, that, the, what I try to say is, that I, I, okay, so in this environment, I want to quadruple my money um, because in, in a normal environment, I want to double my money. So I, I kind of say, can I double my money in the next three to five years using pretty uh, reasonable scenarios. Um, and, and so that's kind of how I, I think about the valuation. I, I mean, I've done all valuation model, you know, I used to model, uh, I I've tried every tool out there on valuation, but at some point you just kind of learn, uh, you just kind of say, well, you know, if this company is growing, uh, most of the companies we're investing in are growing beyond 35%, you know, some of them are growing 90%. Uh, and, and the key is that, um, you know, for example, I'll give you an example, like say with Appian, uh, one of the things that, that I missed as a value investor and when I, it was that their sales and marketing at Appian is actually an investment. And so the same thing happened at Amazon. It was actually an intern of mine who, who brought this up to me that he, he, he was mathematically inclined and he said, it's impossible that Amazon got to this size without making money. Uh, and he was basically proved it to me. You know, he said that how, how could it be that they only took in this much debt, this much equity, and yet they're this big, you know, it's, they're making money. And what I learned is that, you know, uh, Amazon strategy was kind of like, you know, reinvest uh, and, and, and they were earning very high rates of return on that reinvestment, but it, but it looked like they were losing money. So almost every company I'm invested in is, is at break even or at a loss, but in the case of, uh, App, I think Appian's a good example. When you look at their sales and marketing expense, you know, say it's 130 million, 140 million, um, about 100 million of that earns a return. And they actually earn seven times their money over five years uh, by, by doing that. And the reason is because they're not, it's not a sales expense like putting up a billboard. Uh, so when you look at Redfin, you know, that's a company I've looked at in the past. When they spend sales, sales and marketing, it's, it's a billboard advertisement and it's hard to measure the return. With Appian, what they're doing is they're hiring a person that's going to go and implement the software for a customer. So it's, it's very visible to see that, you know, when they hire that person to implement the software, that's kind of what the kind of return that they earn. Um, so a lot of that, that, that goes into my thinking. Mm -hmm. um, as I'm looking at these companies, uh, again, the traditional value investing model is built on looking at assets or, you know, and, 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 and I've moved now to investing in some of these intangible companies that, that those models don't work anymore. And, and, it, and it really had to do with that Amazon shift, understanding that they're earning superior returns because, you know, most of them grow through word of mouth, the ones I'm invested in. That's another characteristic of great companies. Uh, so Atlassian is a company I'd like to own. Uh, you know, they, they didn't have a sales and marketing budget. Uh, uh, Shopify didn't, you know, in the past Whole Foods, another investment never spent money on advertising. Um, and so again, it's, it's just learning that when they're putting money back in, it, it's, it's, it's to develop a new solution for a customer that's going to give you even more money. And so I just kind of try to keep it simple. Mm -hmm. so, so if you're, if you're this concentrated, I'm guessing your holding period is usually probably longer than most. Or is that not accurate? Like, what's your turnover like normally? I, I've made mistakes. You know, I, I mean, I, 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 you know, I, I think sometimes, um, you know, the biggest mistake I made, uh, and I'm, I'm writing, I'm thinking about this right now, is, is selling Shopify. Not, not all of my position. I still have a very big position, in, but I sold a lot of it. And the reason is because it, it looks like it's trading in an obscene valuation um, right now. And um, what I missed is, is what I call, there's this difference between bounded and unbounded growth. 
And so uh, the unbounded growth means that it, 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 it's, it's a company that keep continually is creating new things that don't exist. So if you look at Shopify, they're not taking an existing market. There's actually no way to calculate the market share of, of Shopify. So many people have tried, they've all gotten it wrong because they're creating a new solution to a problem that's out there. They're actually increasing the number of entrepreneurs that are being created out there. Um, so they're creating a new market. Um, so there's no existing market share to look at. And so those are the hardest to value companies. And that's what I call an unbounded company. Uh, Fastly falls under that category as well. Uh, because it's, it's it, now uh, maybe to better understand it, you've got to understand what bounded means. So bounded would be like my investment in Arista Networks. They sell switches to um, data centers, uh, mainly the, the big cloud providers. Uh, but the thing with Arista is there's only so many data centers. Uh, so their growth is bounded. You know, it's, I'm not going to wake up one day and, and see that their sales are now 90% higher than they were uh, a year ago, you know, maybe for one quarter that could happen, but, uh, you know, sustainably, uh, that's not going to happen. The same thing is with Appian. Um, they're bounded because they're after a certain segment of the, of the, uh, of the customer. They're going after a certain type of customer, but unbounded companies such as Shopify or Amazon is unbounded, you know, it started off with books, but it, it, that wasn't what their business was. You know, they're, they're in, so when you look at Shopify, the reason I say it's unbounded, it's they're about creating solutions for entrepreneurs, whatever that is. And, mm -hmm. and what happens with unbounded companies, those are the ones I shouldn't sell, that I just should continue holding under. And just, it's the same th th thing with Amazon. You know, you just don't sell. Um, and, and, but it's say a, a, an Arista or something were to trade at Shopify's valuations or, or quadruple in price. Well, then I, I think I have a better case for selling. Um, so that's kind of how I'm thinking about selling now. And, and so, uh, you know, I'm always evol you know, evolving, you know, is kind of, I'm always trying to learn from where I screwed up, but I, I think this bounded unbounded is a huge thing. Now, now it's dangerous for me to think that everything's unbounded. I, I'm not going to find many companies that are like that. Like I said, Shopify is, is a very unique case uh, where there was no precedent. Um, Actually, a, another characteristic of Mount Rushmore and the companies I look for is they're the one and only. Um, I got that term from Motley Pool, where they, I think it was David Gardner that says, look for the one and only. Uh, you know, so it's not like Home Depot and Lowe's, you know, it's Shopify, right? Or mm -hmm. I, I think somebody used, it's Tesla, you know, or, or whatever, or what, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's Arista, you know, Arista, you can say they compete with Cisco, but it's like, not really. Um, they, they're doing a completely different thing than Cisco does. Um, it is switches, but it's, it's completely different. Um, it's, it's for cloud providers and Cisco's not geared that way. So um, that's kind of, uh, you know, how I'm now thinking about valuation is that, and that's where value investors miss tech uh, is because so much is, is new uh, solutions that they like to value, or I used to as a value investor, you value what exists, you know? So it's like, oh my gosh, Shopify. When I first bought Shopify, I was trading at 10 times EV to sales. And that was at 20 bucks a share. You know, now we're at over a thousand a share. And, you know, now it's like 40 or 50 times. You know, uh, it, it seems to be this obscene valuation, but it's just, um, you know, it's, it was always expensive. You know, and then Shopify was always trading at 20 times. And then it became 20 times EV to sales. You know, I thought I was really like, you know, straying from my world at 10 times in the initial purchases. But it's just every year they come up with a new product that is just... And, and, and it's, they never think about monetizing things. The whole organization is set up that way where they're about creating the solution and then think about monetizing. And that's what people miss. So when they're talking about Shopify Capital, which is now a big cash flow generator for them, it's because Toby Lukey couldn't find the CEO of Shopify, could not find somebody who pro would provide his entrepreneurs uh, credit on good terms. You know, he was like, he, he got frustrated, you know? So one, one of uh, the other criteria I use is solve on frustration you know, like founded on frustration. So the best companies to invest in is where the CEO had a frustration and they went and solved it, you know? So Shopify mm -hmm. was exactly that case. The story uh, was Toby Lukey, you know, was selling uh, snowboards online and he was just so frustrated with the tools that were out there for him. So he developed them. Uh, Fastly uh, was founded in 2011 because uh, the founder, Artur, uh, Bergman what, uh, 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 had an issue. He was working at Wiki, which is the Wikipedia. He was the CTO at Wiki, but he was very frustrated that he couldn't program 
uh, the things that he needed. And so he went out and created an alternative and then, and then created Fastly. So the best companies are always founded on frustration. Uh, and, and so that's kind of why it's hard for traditional investors because there's, it's just unknown, but you're just kind of, you just know that they're, as long as I, we look at the engagement at the leader, you know, how engaged they are. How can you find that out? Well, I mean, if you look at their Twitter streams or whatever, just what they're saying, are they talking about things about the business or are they talking about racing cars, you know? Um, and they have different engagements at different points. Um, you know, Toby got disengaged. He was interviewing Obama and he was, you know, in the press a lot and he was doing a lot of interviews. Well, that told me he wasn't as engaged as Shopify, you know, and then the recession comes, uh, all these problems start, he's 100% engaged. You don't see him out there uh, doing a lot of these things. Um, so that's, that's the key thing that we're, we're looking at also for value creation, because when the leader gets less engaged in the business, the, I've seen it over and over, the value just starts to drop. I'm seeing it at Amazon today. Uh, the amount of talent that is leaving Amazon today is obscene. And it has to do with Jeff Bezos no longer being as engaged at Amazon. He's engaged in other activities. Um, you know, maybe he's just burnt out. Uh, but talent is leaving the door because they're just not working on interesting things anymore. They need that leader to kind of push them and they want that. And so they're just no longer interested in working there. Um, so the talent is leaving. Um, and so that's something we monitor as well is like the talent at a, co at a company. We looked at LinkedIn profiles, like who's joining, where are they joining from? So if you're hiring a bunch of executives, um, you know, from Oracle, I don't think that's a good sign. That's a very bureaucratic, difficult company to work for, very aggressive, uh, sales oriented. You know, you won't see Oracle employees working at Shopify or not many at least, um, and, and so we kind of look at where are people coming from, where are they leaving to, things like that. We, we had a question pop up and um, let me see if I can read it first and then see if I can synthesize it a little bit. Um, the Mount Rushmore characteristics of leadership, do you think they're best attributed to technology companies or do you think those attributes also can be, you know, should, are attributes you would look for to run a more traditional business as well? Yeah, I think, uh, I think you can have them in, uh, you know, Walt Disney, uh, you know, historically. Um, it's just anybody who's, uh, you know, the old General Electric, I'm talking about like the 1930s <laughs> General Electric, um, you know, the people that ran those companies, uh, Ford. Uh, well, I'm not sure about Ford. I need, I need to rephrase that. Um, <laughs> you've done a lot of historical studies. I, I, think, I think it's more just the type of leader um, I think just things have changed to technology today, but in the past it was retail. So Jim Senegal would be a Mount uh, Rushmore leader, at, you know, the way he ran Costco um, because he had certain characteristics. You know, he had the problem solving mentality. He had the uh, customer interests in mind. And that, and that comes from problem solving, you know, where you have your, your customer's best interest. You're not trying to sell to them and extract from them. Um, you know, you're not trying to get the last dollar, sell them things they don't need. You know, selling, if you look at it in a continuum, is, is about convincing you to buy something that you really don't need. You know, mm -hmm. like uh, you, you, the, the worst case is like the TV advertising late night, you know, ShamWow towels and things like that. But again, going back to the problem solving, um, that, that just, that would be in any industry. I just think today technology is the new wave. Um, I don't know what it'll be, you know, 20 years from now, but there's, yeah, I think it just applies to any industry. Um, mm -hmm. The Tatas in India, you know, Ratan, uh, the, the Tata family, um, kind of the older ones were, were Mount Rushmore and, and, and doing industrial type things. So uh, yeah, I do think it, it applies to all industries. It's just, it's just, there's more now in the technology field um, just because that's kind of the, the new area. Okay. And just a reminder, if anybody has a question, you can type it in in the Q&A section on the bottom of your screen. So I have this wonderful <laughs> book. Um, just curious, what caused you to write this book? And you wrote this, I believe, in 2012. And so it's been eight years since then. But just maybe talk about what inspired you to write it. And then maybe after that, just talk about um, maybe anything today that you wish you would have added to the book today. Yeah. You write it again. Um, so I didn't set out to write a book. What happened is I had developed all these uh, checklists uh, to, so one of the, my biggest frustrations with Warren Buffett was uh, that he never told you how to do things, you know, invest in great leaders. It's like, 
well, how do you know? Oh, I meet with them and in five minutes I know. Well, that's all he would you know, give you. And so I had this frustration of like, well, how do I do that? You know? and, and so I developed uh, you know, these kind of a checklist to look at a company holistically you know, to kind of better understand it. And, uh, and so I put the kind of a, a rough format. And then a friend of mine, Paul Sonkin, who's a microcap uh, investor, old microcap, put me in touch with somebody named Judd Kahn, who put me in touch with Wiley about writing a book. And so that's kind of how the, the book mm. came about. And then I, my whole framework in writing the book was that I said, I'm not writing a book to sell my, myself, you know, like it's going to be to learn. Um, so, and I do that today in my quarterly letters, I write to learn. I don't write to uh, sell an approach, uh, you know, so a lot like my Mount Rushmore leaders, I don't want to be talking about you know, oh, you should invest in my, in my type of invest, you know, the, the, in, I'm in this world or I'm in this quadrant and, and I can reduce your risk in this way. You know, I, I never would want to use language. So I, I write to learn. And so I basically wrote that book for myself when I was 21 and entering the business, you know, like mm-hmm. what is a way to get a holistic view of the business? So, you know, I, I don't go through a big old checklist today, you know, but I had to early on as I trained, like, for example, like debt, you know, it's like I used to study debt in, in you know, the covenants and, and, and study everything about debt. You know, today I just glance at it, you know, and I look at the notes and I'm like, not a problem, you know, and, and today even, in fact, most of the companies I invest in, they don't have debt. So it's not mm-hmm. even, it's just by, Mount Rushmore leaders tend to be debt averse anyways. So um, it's not an issue, but it allowed me to learn um, you know, it, it, it caught areas that I did understand. I thought I understood return on invested capital. And when I went to write that chapter, I learned I really didn't know what it was. You know, because mm-hmm. it depends on the company you're studying, right? Like I, I gave you the Appian example with some companies, they earn a return on their sales and marketing, the other they don't. If you're a TV broadcaster, your return on capital is different than, than, a, than a, you know, Semex, a, a cement manufacturer. Uh, so it, it kind of exposed those gaps. So I, I kind of wrote it to really learn and solidify because I knew I was writing it for third parties. I wanted to be re- write it in a very simple way, but like for me entering the business to give me a holistic view of a company. And, and examine it from a different, a, a lot of different uh, angles. Um, you know, the, what I would do different, def- but I mean, I don't think I could have at that time was the, the, the leadership has become my whole focus. I think uh, you change the leader, you change the country, you change the, you know, I'm talking about not, not today's politics, but like Singapore, you know, that guy, Lee Kuan Yew, took a swamp and, grew, and, and, and created a first world nation that's like the leader of Asia and actually inspired China to, to be what it is today. Um, and so it all, it, it's all driven. Look at Venezuela, you know, what a horrible place. I have friends that are Venezuelans that, you know, before and after uh, Chavez and now Maduro, like it, it just changes overnight. The same thing goes for a company. And so I've learned that what I do is I follow the leadership because that is the most, that's the way I can predict um, everything else I can't predict. I can't predict by looking at a balance sheet. I can't predict by looking at historical results. I can't predict, uh, you know, by doing all the other things that, that, that we've been taught in financial analysis. It, it, just, it, it just allows you to learn what's there. And so I, I think my biggest uh, change has been really focusing on leadership because it is, it's how you predict things. Human behavior is predictable. And, and the certain patterns that, that leaders exhibit um, allows you to predict whether something will be a success or not. Um, mm-hmm. the, another question we had come in is, you know, if you look for problem solvers, yeah. you know, do you also look for, you know, the problem solver that paired with someone who is also sales focused? Do you look at see how engaged their sales force is? I mean, do, is there a combination of those two that you think works? Yeah, I think I'd say in most of my investments, like the five I have now, they all grew through word of mouth. So they don't even have a sales. When they have a sales, it's about implementation. So uh, the sales force is, is an implementation force. So it's there to guide the customer in using the product or service. You look at Arista Networks. I don't think they've spent any money. Maybe they do com- at conferences on, on advertising in a magazine, like buy the Arista uh, switch. You know, it'll make you go faster. You know, there, there's, there's none of that. Um, but most of their sales is engineers uh, that are there to implement it. I mean, if you look at FactSet, I, I'm a user of the service, you know, their sales folks are actually people that come up from the ranks of using the product. And, and so they, when a, when a FactSet person came to sell me FactSet, they said, what do you need? To, what do you need? You know, like, what, what, do you, what do you use? You know, 
And so they kind of showed me like, oh, they, oh well, FactSet will help you do that, you know? And so they didn't come in and say, oh, you got to use FactSet because everybody else is using FactSet and, you know, you're going to get left behind and we have the best data. You know, that's, that's a different kind of thing. So I'd say the best companies grow through word of mouth. You know, Costco didn't advertise. Uh, you look at historically, they've all grown through word of mouth. Um, because they don't need to convince customers. It's so easy to see the value proposition that it's like going to a good restaurant. You know it when you see it, you know? So they don't need to tell you how good they are. And that also brings me to another thing on, on Mount Rushmore leaders is it's, it's something I've learned. They never tell you how great they are because I, you know, I'm around, um, it's like dangerous people don't tell you they're dangerous. You know, like, hey, don't mess with me. I'm dangerous. They just freaking hit you, you know? <laughs> they just do it. They just do it. Um, the same thing happens with a good CEO. They just do it. They don't want to tell you how good they are. Uh, one of the best privately company, uh, pri private companies uh, I've ever seen is a company called HEB, uh, Mount Rushmore Leader for sure. They never uh, talk about anything they do for the community. You know, they just do it. Uh, they don't talk about some articles have been written about them, but very little press. And the reason they do that is because they don't want to be unduly influenced by the public. They don't want to do things for adulation. Uh, so another way you can find good CEOs is if they start referencing third parties a lot, like JD Power said, or this third party, you know, said our products are the best. A Mount Rushmore leader would never say that. They don't, they don't even really pay attention to that. Or uh, the Gartner Magic Quadrant, we're high. I've never heard Toby say we're high on the, you know, or, or Arista. Maybe the, maybe some of the people within Arista will say, it, but never the founder. Um, so that's another way you kind of spot them. Just throw in some of that. <laughs> sure. No, thank you. Go ahead, Mike. So, so Michael, um, I have a question. Um, so Morgan Housel wrote uh, an article about a year and a quarter about the ironies of luck. And actually I wrote a follow on article sort of, based off of that, um, talking about leveraging luck. And I, you haven't said this, but I suspect that this is part of your style is that you're looking for management teams that like might be innovative in a way that you can't even predict as an investor. And you're looking for somebody just that, you know, it's like, think about Amazon, for example, you know, they started out with Beanie Babies and, you know, who, who thought that a Beanie Baby would have like all the different services that we have now, but you have a great management team that's kind of figured out how to take that initial concept, add other things on, or even, un, even things that are, you know, kind of far off from what they're doing, but helpful. And you just have a management team that can, you know, pull a, you know, pull a rabbit out of a hat that you would never expect, as opposed to, um, looking at a company from like their financials and like, okay, I think they can grow by this, they can grow by this. And so how does that resonate to you? How does that, you know, reflect on how you think? Yeah. So a mentor of mine taught me that, uh, he's actually a, a, a famous comedian. Um, uh, uh, he said, there's no such thing as luck, you know, like it's just a word we use that to put things that we don't explain, but I think it's timing. Uh, you know, so uh, I think I look at a lot, is this the right time? Is the technology there? Um, so if you, uh, you know, so when I'm looking at, say, a Shopify, I look, I see that they're solving a big problem. You know, they're not solving a niche. So you, you use the example of a Beanie Baby. Even Amazon, you know, it's just kind of like a, it's, it's like a, a step on the way there. But it's not like they said, we're going to specialize in selling uh, Beanie Babies, you know, it's, it's it, it, Toby from the beginning of starting Shopify said, we want to lower the barriers to entry for entrepreneurs. We basically want to take away all of the things that uh, don't help them create value and, and solve those problems for them. And so they can get started with their business without having to think about a website or a payments or, or uh, having to set all this stuff up. Um, so I kind of look at it more from how big of the problem they're solving in order to get to my growth. Uh, but also if they're using language that is kind of a bit, a little bit bigger like that, like we want to be the entrepreneurial operating system. Well, that's a pretty big customer base. But if I see a, a customer, you know, somebody say, well, we want to service uh, this vertical. Well, um, then I can, I can understand kind of its growth is more like going back to bounded. Um, but even the CEOs did not know, like Toby Lutke that I knew various times had no idea his company would be as big as it is. Um, and, and so he, he couldn't see it either. But, but I, I think that's kind of the, the thing. It's just that you, I, so I focus like when I say timing, you know, is the technology there? Uh, is it simple to use? Are they having a lot of trouble 
uh, you know, uh, do, doing it. Like I wouldn't invest in autonomous cars. The timing is horrible, right? Like it's just like the, nothing is there to make it work except maybe, uh, you know, in very certain use cases. So I know it's not going to be a, a big grow, you know, it's growing, but it's just, it's a, the technology is not there to make it a viable product yet. Um, so I kind of focus more on the, on the timing side than, than the luck side. Yeah. Does so that answer your question? Yeah, I think so. It's, so, so it's just to rephrase, it's probably scope of business in certain terms of what their possibility is and then timing added on top of that. Is that yeah. kind of, yeah. Well, like, like Fastly, yeah, is one I'm invested in now. And I mean, the, they, they have a very broad customer base. You know, they, they're not going for one niche like, oh, well, we only service e-commerce uh, providers. So, so they're, they're defining their problem in a very broad way, uh, which brings in a lot of people. I don't know if that. Yeah, yeah. And so the interesting thing on micro caps, just the kind of like, you know, the stuff Ian and I do, they're, they're tiny, tiny, tiny. And often, you know, they say, you know, if we hear a company say, you know, we're going <laughs> to, we're going to solve the whole online shopping, oh, yeah. uh, you know, thing. We're like, yeah, right. You know, you got $2 million in the bank and you aren't making money. Yeah. And so the good ones, actually, they start with a small problem. Yeah like in a space and they grow and they, once they solve that, then they add more and more. And sometimes you don't even know where they're going. So it's kind of a, it's interesting because it's kind of a different, I think, think the size of the companies kind of changes things a bit. And you, you really, in these small companies, you can't invest in somebody that has this big, big scope, but you can invest in somebody that has a small niche in that scope that eventually could be big. Yeah, I'd say the, uh, as I, I'm, through Ian, I'm familiar with microcap. I think the tell, you know, the catch is if they, they allude to a market share. So the Mount Rushmore's never talk about a market yep. share. They, so the moment they say our market is 50 billion, you know, it's like, yeah, the, Toby's <laughs> never said our market is 100 billion. You know, never, I mean, it, they've asked him market share questions and he's like, you know, he just kind of throws out an answer. But, he, but, but I would say that's how you would the differentiator is one is saying, well, we're, you know, we're, our market share is 50 billion. That's another way I kind of pass uh, on them. So they're more about, you know, we're trying to solve these problems. And then I'm like, well, that's a lot of people, you know? Uh, so that's more of an assessment from my end that I'm saying that's a, that's a broad audience than, than a niche uh, type thing. But yeah, I'd say when they, the micro crap world, I, I did see that they throw those market share numbers. You're right. And say, well, we'll, <laughs> You know, we only need 1% of that market, you know, and that's, that's sales, right? Yeah. That's taking this, that's not problem solving. That's not saying, how are you solving the customer's problem? You know, what are you doing to solve their problem? Right. I think we, I think we have time for a couple more questions. I hear my wife pulled in the garage, which means my kids will be bursting through the store very shortly. But uh, maybe the, maybe one of them, I think we have a, a few emerging fund managers on this and maybe will be on YouTube that watch it later. Uh, what do you think, what's some of the advice you would give any emerging manager today? Maybe some of the lessons you learned. Oh man, I'd, I'd say the biggest one is that, and this is, I just learned this and I'm sorry I learned it at this age, but I, I look at the world, I, I was trying to be an asset manager my whole life in a way, you know, and that meant I had traditional portfolio construction methods. I spoke the language of the industry, but I'm an investor, you know, so there's two different types, you know, there's asset managers and there's investors. It's like thinking of a hospital. The hospital owner is the asset manager. You know, they're choosing surgeons, they're selling products. Um, they've got different, but they're not investors. The investor's a surgeon, right? So, it, you know, I'd say, you know, you got to choose either one. You can't be, you know, you, you can kind of do both okay, you know, but um, what happens is that as an asset manager, you get trapped into, when I was in an endowment committee, into thinking a certain way that because most asset managers are, are managing a traditional portfolio uh, for traditional things. Reversion of the mean, as a, as a friend of mine says, um, is, is the way most of that works, you know, competitive advantages and things like that. So I think the main thing is you need to ask is, do I want to be an investor? Do I want to be an asset manager? Which is, do I want to run the hospital, have employees under me, uh, be meeting with lots of clients? Or do I want to be focused on, you know, I'd throw you in uh, knowing you as an investor, right? Like you're not, you know, on the fund management is kind of secondary and it kind of people are joining you in a way. Um, so I think you kind of have to pick. Most people I know are asset managers. Um, so 
if that's your thing, well then go learn how to fundraise, go learn how to speak the language, get in with the endowments, you know, learn, learn the lingo. Um, but, but I, I just, you know, so much I, as an investor, I would feel bad not being an asset manager because I wasn't managing the amounts of money they were. And it was very frustrating and I felt like a loser, but quite frankly, I didn't want to go out and, and raise money, you know? So I wasn't doing what the other people were doing um, because I just never enjoyed it. And so it was until this year, it just it hit on me. I'm like, I'm an investor and I'm going to stick to being an investor. And that means forget having 20% allocations. I mean, I'm managing my own money. You know, I, 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 if I want to have 50% of my fund and in, in, uh, of my money in, in, a, in a stock, I'm going to do it. And so I think you, you, you got to make that distinction early on is what I mm-hmm. would, would counsel. You know, which way do you want to go? There's more freedom as an investor. Um, mm-hmm. So Ian, you can take off time. I take off time. Yeah, we, we have lots of freedom. Um, as an asset manager, you don't have freedom. Uh, you, you, you got quarterly calls, monthly calls. You got, you, you got a certain regimen. Uh, uh, you're corporate in many ways. You, you got to live a corporate lifestyle. So it also comes down to what kind of lifestyle do you want? Do you like a lot your freedom? But being okay, don't be like me. There's a lot of envy in our industry. That's the other thing to avoid as an emerging, you know, focus on learning, um, not comparing. You know, I, I think Ian and I are now old enough to know that we've seen people come and go. You know, it's like some value investors that had these billion dollar funds. You know, you hear about them. It's like, what are they doing? You know, it's not, they're not doing that anymore. So don't, don't compare. Um, and, and that's where I went. I lost a lot of time is having envy and, and, and spending time on, on comparing myself to others. But I was, I was basically compare, frustrated I wasn't a hospital owner. But I didn't want to be a hospital owner, but I was frustrated I wasn't. It just made no sense. Um, that's what I would counsel. Just decide what you want to do. <laughs> that's that's great advice. Um, if maybe to 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 leave it for everybody, how would people get in touch with you? How do people? Do you want people to receive your quarterly letters? If so, how do they ob- obtain them? Uh, through you, you know, you've become okay. A... <laughs> so yeah, I guess through you. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> um, well, thanks everybody for for tuning in. It, um, I think this was it was great. We had a lot of great questions, and thanks, Michael, for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thanks. All right.